and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, as you can probably gather from the title of my talk, I'm a massive fan of statistics and methods more generally, but <laughs> statistics spe specifically. Um, and I want you to think about um, how you might learn to love statistics and methods if you don't already. So, what I'm going to talk to you today is about, it's all about research integrity and the future of psychology. You guys are the future of psychology. You are our early career researchers. You are going to change what we know about statistics. And I'm going to tell, or not statistics, about the field, sorry, wider than statistics. You're going to change the field, and I'm going to tell you how you're going to do it. And I'm going to talk about five different things. I'm going to talk about stats life. I'm going to talk about collaboration, replication, interpretation, and education. So let's get started. So we live in an unprecedented age. This is a really exciting time to choose psychology as a career. But I think we need to think about what the point of statistics is here today. We are sitting in a world where we talk about fake news. Anyone heard of uh, Trump? Anyone heard of Trump here? Good. We're not fully asleep after lunch. So in this Trump era, we're seeing figures plucked from the air. We're seeing figures manipulated, being used for certain agendas. We're not seeing the objective truth that we hope for when we think about statistics. We're also dealing with Brexit. Anyone heard of Brexit? Yeah, I know too. And regardless of whether you are leave or remain, it is absolutely factual that statistics have been manipulated to persuade people to vote one way or another. And possibly they may or may not have changed their minds since. Statistics has a reputational problem. We hear about lies, damned lies, and statistics. There are many books with this title. Some are cartoons, some are like textual books. We have a reputational problem. And if you're ever on Twitter, is anyone here on Twitter? Excellent, I hope you're tweeting along. Feel free to tweet any of my slides. Obviously, if I look really bad, could you put a filter on or something like that um, to help me out? Um, but feel free to tweet along today. Um, and if you follow anybody who's a statistician on Twitter, quite often they can be really negative. Have you seen this paper? These figures don't add up. This person doesn't know how to use p-values. This technique is misapplied. And if you are in any way nervous about your statistics and applying these methods, this might make you very cautious. So I think the, the purpose of your stats life and mine is to inform and educate. But in this new world order, we also have to learn to persuade using our statistics. This is not necessarily something we had to do before. But if the nasty people are doing it, then we need to be doing it on the side of justice and psychology. And we have this incredible opportunity to use our statistics for good. So I said I would talk about collaboration. Collaborate and build a team. Statistics does not happen in a vacuum. I'm very fortunate at Ulster University that we have a lot of really incredible statisticians we have a number of statistics courses and things like that, and I have this lovely team that I can work with. That may not be the case for you. If you're stuck, you can, always, you can always email me. My email address is at the end as well if you're stuck and on your own with statistics. But build your team, and there's some sneaky ways to do it as well, because we always like sneaky ways. We don't always want everything handed to us. So if you don't have the people in your department, what can you do? Well, you can create a special interest group at your university. Try and find other people, talk to other people. Sometimes you can send those big staff emails around to everybody and try and build up maybe a journal group or some other group that helps to, to work with stats. You can also use uh, mailing lists. Just mail is a good one. You can get them on topic, so things like network analysis, or you can get them on things like software, like Stata or M+. So try those. You can also go on training courses. Training courses are brilliant. Because not only are you training with other people who are at the same stage as you, but you can then make them your friends afterwards. And they can become your wonderful statistical networking team. 
And that is what's going to help you uh, when we move away from those really polished examples and you're using your own data and all sorts of things come up and models are not identifying and you don't know what's going on and why is this happening? Because as I know, as somebody who does a lot of training courses in statistics, we use kind of sanitized data because we know it works and things like that. When you're using your own, things tend to get messy. So that's when you need your friends. So how do you do that? Your business cards. If your university don't let you do business cards because you're a PhD student, swap emails. Make this work for you. The other one is SciPag. Do we have anybody from SciPag here? SciPag is wonderful. I cannot stress that more highly enough. They have all sorts of supportive networks for you as a postgraduate. I highly recommend that you get involved with them one way or another. They also have mailing lists and all sorts of fantastic things. Um, and one last thing based on a conversation I just had with uh, a lady next door is just to remember that stats is a new language. It's not hard, but it is hard work. So, you know, if you're finding it difficult, believe in yourself that you can do it. So, why did I say this is an opportunity? You have this incredible opportunity to disrupt the field. We have something called a replication crisis, which sounds really like everything is miserable and we should all just go home and cry for a bit. Now you can go and do that or we can turn that on its head and see this as an opportunity to challenge what's going on and what is known in psychology with research you're doing today. Uh, the Open Science uh, Collaboration did this repli replicability exercise, which is a really hard word to say, um, and they found around 28% of studies could be replicated. This is not great, people. So this is our opportunity to find out what's really going on, to really understand uh, behaviour, and to really use psychology to inform, to educate, uh, and to persuade. So this is the most text heavy slide that I have because I get a little bit excited about p-values. The truth is, most people do. You need to work with but not be fooled by p-values. And this cartoon on the right, or the right hand side is a bit of a funny thing, but actually you will see a lot of the times in the literature, I do a lot of statistical reviewing for journals, for like funding boards, and you get approaching significance, and all these kind of woolly, random, nonsensical statements. Avoid those like the plague. We're all doing amazing science in here. We don't need those kind of things. Embrace the uncertainty. Report the point estimates and the spread of data. So we want to think about confidence intervals, standard deviations, those kind of things. It's not enough just to tell us what the mean was, but give us more information so we can make those kind of judgments and embrace uncertainty. Because if we find that P is less than 0.05, yes, that is a fun thing to find, but it's actually not, doesn't make it absolute. This is, no law, this is not the absolute truth now. Report your data with precision. P equals is your friend. P is less than 0.05 is meaningless in the new world order. It's always P equals. And you can report with precision, and you don't even have to make up how this precision looks, because other people in your team that are not like really linked with your team, but if you see as the rest of the field as your team, as well as the people that you know one-on-one, -on -one, something called the Equator Network has a whole range of ways to report data on lots of different study designs, including qualitative and quantitative designs. Use those tools to your benefit. You should neither over nor understate your findings. There's a tendency for early career researchers to go, oh, it's just, mm, it's just a little finding. Oh, mm. Don't be doing that. Tell people what you found and tell them why it's important. Don't forget to talk about the limitations and the explanations around what you've got as statistics. And don't overstate. This is, this is one paper will not change everything. You, it's all about adding uh, to data in a certain direction. And to educate yourself about P. Now, I could go on for about three days, but Daryl will get very upset with me about what the P value is and all the philosophical arguments. If you're interested in this and educating yourself, I highly recommend a book by Cummings called The New Statistics. And it's all about thinking about how we use the statistical tools to tell truths. 
This is happening right now. So you can be part of this. This is a Nature article that came out yesterday. Yesterday. So this is the time to be doing exciting things in psychology. And you can be doing that. So, just checking how I'm doing for time. I've got 10 minutes. So thinking through the early parts of your research. So thinking through the design. We had a nice conversation early on about how we might think about our research question, explore the ideas around research questions, and then go about uh, sort of formulating research designs. So thinking through the early parts of your research is really, really very important. And it's really important in this new era. We have a lot of established sort of protocols around reporting things like systematic reviews or randomized control trials. We say what we're going to do in advance, and then we go and do it. And this means that we can't distort the evidence. We can't just change things around because we didn't find what we liked. And it's variably applied as well, because even though that this has been going, I think CONSORT, which is the reporting guidance for uh, randomized trials, has been going since 1996, we still find people don't use them. So, uh, but of course, all of you guys here will be using all of these reporting standards, of course. So here's one that I wrote earlier. Uh, it's my research area is in addictions. So here's an alcohol brief intervention protocol from Prospero, which does a lot of health protocols. And here is a trial that I ran uh, on self-help interventions for alcohol, uh, registered at the ISRCTN registry. And I've just popped those links down there. Highly recommend that you think about registering all of these things. But if it's not a review or a trial, we have a solution called the Open Science Framework. It is free to you and me and anyone else who wants to use it. This allows you to lay out your plans very, very clearly in advance. And everyone can see them. Now, at first you might be thinking, oh gosh, what if somebody steals my ideas? What am I going to do? Ah, they've thought of that. They can't steal your idea because you've got a date and a time when your idea was registered as your idea. So if it ends up being a situation where you're going, you stole my idea, you go, no, I didn't. Have you not seen my page on the open science framework? Good <laughs> exactly. And anyone here a little bit disorganized? Do you have a desktop full of files and you don't really know what things and you call them weird things like last version, last, last, last version, <laughs> last, 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 last version, etc. Well, you'll find that the open science framework helps you be a little bit more Marie Kondo about these things. You suddenly become very organized when you have to air your dirty laundry in public. So all your files are properly named and all of the things are very well organized. And suddenly you became an organized researcher as if by magic. And you get to lay out your plans for all psychological research. Now, why would you even bother doing that, aside from the idea that you don't get your ideas stolen and those kinds of things? Why would you even bother with that level of activity? Well, there is a movement towards this idea that we do confirmatory research, so that we decide in advance what we're going to do, how we're going to measure it, what our research question is, and we put it out there. And then we go and we see whether that is the case or not. If we find that P is greater than or less than 0 0.05, we just stop there. That's it. You don't kind of fiddle around, change the variable, rename it, do this, dichotomize it, or make any kind of adjustments. You just do what you said you would do, and then you report what you find. It's very exciting. And if you're fond of good science, you'll probably be very aware of uh, Ben Goldacre. And he has quoted that uh, as saying, you cannot find your starting hypothesis and your final results. It makes your stats go all wonky. And he is 100% correct in this particular assertion. Uh, one of these things you might hear uh, is harking, which is hypothesizing after the fact. And other researchers have said that 92% of articles confirmed their hypothesis. So they found what they said they would find. That seems a little bit illogical to me. So you've got to be really careful. There's a lot of issues around publishing null results. We're in a replication crisis, people. We need to be publishing the null results so we actually get to the bottom of the science and what's really going on in psychology. This happened the other day. So um, this particular journal editor, so journal editors are very high up in the field, are saying that they just move papers to a, a journal with a lower impact factor because they are not, um, because they have 
negative or null findings. Resist this nonsense everywhere you see it. It is completely inappropriate. We need to be reporting null results or negative findings. So we don't all end up heading down a black hole that everyone else has been down and found nothing in. It means we're free to do other kinds of science. Oh, so don't publish whatever, uh, you need to publish whatever P you find, is what I'm trying to say, and resist all efforts from people who may be more senior than you, challenge them, because this is what science depends on this. Psychological science depends on this. I'm a big fan, if your gut is telling you that there's something not right with the analysis that you've done, then you need to keep going round and making sure that you get it right. Double check things, double check the figures from the tables from your output. If you feel that something's not quite right, do not put anything in the public domain until you're absolutely sure you've got your stats right. And I know all these things are a matter of degree, but go with your gut and feel comfortable because there are new machine learning techniques and things like stats.io that people can run your paper through this. You can also run your paper through this as well online. Um, and it will tell you if there's something wrong with your stats from a mathematical point of view. And you don't want to be caught out. And it's only going to get worse. They're only going to find new and more exciting ways that I don't understand as a non-computer scientist to find us out. So get your stats right. So you have good design. You collect your data, you analyze your data, then you check everything's okay. Is everything okay? Am I comfortable with this? Am I comfortable with this being my career defining moment? And then you publish. So the last thing I want to do, I think this is an exciting time for psychologists, an exciting time for early career psychologists. You, if you use statistics or indeed if you use qualitative methods or better still, you do mixed methods um, uh, and you sort of take whatever approach to the question. You have extraordinarily useful, interesting tools to drive psychology forward, to challenge what we know, we've seen with some of the classic studies in, in future times, they may also be found not to be true in the present day. And with extraordinary tools at your disposal, you can do very extraordinary things, but you must use your power wisely you must educate yourself on how to do good statistics, build your team around you to make sure you've got that support, to be absolutely sure that you've got it right, um, and enjoy your statistics. Don't be afraid. Use your power wisely. Thank you very much.